Greetings and welcome to the 31st Annual Historic Calgary Week. As mentioned, I mentioned, my name is Walter Boney, and I'd like to thank you for coming to building the Sandstone City. Now I'd like to introduce Sherry Pyle. As a young girl, Sherry fell in love with history while modeling an antique hat at a historic home. When she grew up, she really dug into the past and received a BSc and MA degrees in archaeology from the University of Calgary. Since then, she has worn many hats, archaeologist, college instructor, archivist, oral historian, and author. For more than a decade, she has focused on Glenville Ranch Provincial Park, researching the lives of the Glenville quarry workers and their families. She writes a monthly history column for the Park Foundation and will be guiding a special tour during the upcoming 10th anniversary celebrations of the park's opening. Her forthcoming book, Alberta's Cornerstone, Archaeological Adventures in a Ghost Town illustrates the sometimes surprising ways Glenville residents contributed to history. Alberta's Cornerstones, Cornerstone is slated for release in spring 2022 by Heritage House Publishing. Today, Sherry will be highlighting the role of stoneworkers in the construction of Calgary's iconic sandstone buildings. Take it away, Sherry. Thank you, Walt. Okay, um, so today I'm going to give you an introduction to why Calgary became known as the Sandstone City. Um, I will look at some of the buildings in the city that are made of sandstone, and then I'm going to talk about some of the people who helped to create the Sandstone City. We'll start with what you see in front of you, a view of Stephen Avenue or 8th Avenue in 1905. And you can see rows of sandstone buildings lining the street. And in case you can't read the handwriting at the top, I thought it was a good start for this talk. It says, this is where they have me now and it's a rattling good place. This and many of the other photos that I'm going to be using tonight are thanks to Anita Dammer, the digitization assistant and Kim Giraldi, the reference specialist at the Glenville Collection, Libraries and Cultural Resources, University of Calgary. And I have provided a handout as well with some of the resources that I'm going to be referring to tonight. So you don't have to be trying to write down a URL if you see something that you'd like to find out more information about. One of those things um, is a walking tour. And um, it tells you why Calgary is called the Sandstone City. It's especially because of the historic downtown district. And um, this you can download from the City of Calgary website, which is the URL that's at the bottom. So that's on the handout that you can get. Here um, is an uh, example of one of those early sandstone buildings. Most of Calgary's sandstone buildings date predominantly from 1886 to 1914. Two of the earliest sandstone buildings were the IG Baker store, which you see here. It was built in 1886, and it's shown in this slide in 1888. Sandstone buildings are rare in Calgary before 1886. Most of Calgary before this point was built out of wood. And here you see the same street in 1884 or 1885. There's not a sandstone building visible and it's all out of wood. And you can even see some of the frontier false fronts being propped up further down the street. And it makes sense. Wood was relatively inexpensive, quick, to build with, easy to use. You didn't have to have the same levels of skill that you needed to build a building out of sandstone, for example. However, it does have one drawback. On the 7th of November, 1886, fire broke out and it ended up destroying 18 of the town's 70 wooden buildings. And you can see here, people have dragged the items out of those stores, trying to save them in case the structure should start on fire. So the result was that the city uh, pushed for construction of fire resistant buildings made of sandstone or brick. And that's how we got the sandstone city. Now sandstone buildings are in general fire resistant, not fireproof as this sh slide shows. This was taken on the 9th of May, 1916. At 4.30 in the afternoon, fire broke out 
in this old government industrial building in East Calgary. And by the end of it, only the sandstone exterior was remaining. You can see the firemen there posing um, after the conclusion of this blaze. This was a noteworthy fire. If you, if you take a look at the date, you can get a clue why. It was uh, occurred during World War I. And um, the reason why it was so serious was because there was ordnance stored in the lower part of the building. There were nearly 400 cases of ammunition, including 10 pound shells that were stored in this building. So they had to move quickly to put out the fire and to remove those boxes before they caused a major explosion. They did manage to get them all out, but the last ones they removed were fairly scorched. So it was a close call. Some buildings were intentionally constructed to be fireproof. They had additional techniques that were used. So this is a, a classic example of that. This is the Calgary Land Titles Building. And I'm gonna read you a list of the different um, materials that are incorporated into this building. So the, we'll start on the outside and work our way in. The exterior um, steps are made out of granite. The glass has a wire in it to prevent shattering. There's concrete, sandstone, and steel forming the structure of the building. Inside you'll find plaster, marble, ornamental iron. The counters were sheet metal. The interior stairs were made out of cast iron and they had copper handrails. The doors were of paneled copper. And on the floors, if you didn't have marble, then in the other areas where there were concrete floors, they would put on cork carpet or rubber. The only wood in the entire building was in the exterior windows and doors. So they'd made a concerted effort to make it fireproof to protect all of those valuable land documents. So if you had a choice between sandstone and brick, why did they choose sandstone? Well, it was a common local resource. Here you see an outcropping of the Pascapu Formation, which is the name that geologists give to this layer of stone. This stone was formed by rivers and streams, so it's called fluvial in the language of the geologists. And you can see some of that layering that would form um, in a river, and that's called bedding. This formation, the Pascapu Formation, dates to the Paleocene Epoch, which is the name for the geological time period. And in time, it's 66 to 56 million years ago. Now, there were many quarries in and around Calgary, more than a dozen. This basic map is also from the City of Calgary website, and it's quite old. Um, the situation is much more complicated than this leads you to believe. And that's because the quarries um, changed hands many times. And so when you're reading historic documents, it's hard to tell the exact location sometimes that they're talking about when they name a person's quarry. I think that this is going to be examined in a bit more detail by the Edwardy Park Heritage Society in their new book that's soon to be released. And I've included the email that you can write to to find out more information about that book on the handout. Now, my research has focused on the Glenbow Quarry, which is located in the Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park between Calgary and Cochrane. Now, I am biased, I will admit it, but I do believe that the Glenbow Quarry is the most important quarry for sandstone in the province. Um, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. I'm going to focus uh, this talk on buildings that used Glenbow stone, and this stone was used all over the province. The biggest contract was for the legislature building and it uh, is composed of Glenbow stone from the exterior of the first floor all the way to the dome, excluding the columns at the front. Glenbow stone also built government house, which is the former home of the Lieutenant Governor. And we might not recognize how widespread the use of sandstone was because some of the sandstone buildings in the province no longer exist. The Edmonton Courthouse is an example made of Glenbow stone, but it was demolished in 1972. The Edmonton Land Titles Building is here shown in 1912 when it's being constructed out of Glenbow stone, but it was demolished in 1952. 
Another way that sandstone was used rather than being an entire exterior was to use it as an accent. And that's what was done here on the Alberta Acute Hostel for the Insane in Pinoco, which is the name they gave it when it was built in 18, uh, 1908 to 1911. But now it's called the Centennial Center for Mental Health and Brain Injury. But since this presentation is really about Calgary, not about all of Alberta, let's focus in. Here you can see the Calgary Customs House. And again, the Glen Bow Stone is used as an accent on a brick building. Now you might wonder why we have a customs house when we're nowhere near an ocean, but Calgary was a port of entry. So imported goods and mail were examined and then assessed for taxes in this building before they were sent on for distribution to their destination. The building was built by the federal government from 1912 to 1916. Here's Calgary Courthouse number two, more Glenbow Stone in Calgary. This building was constructed in 1912 to 1914, and it does still exist, just like the Customs House still stands, um, but this building is now um, unoccupied. Here you can see it being constructed in 1912, roughly, uh, beside the land titles office that I've already told you a little bit about. Now, Calgary has also lost sandstone buildings, and here's a group of them. The Land Titles Building, which I've described already, was located on 7th Avenue and 4th Street Southwest. It was built between 1907 and 1909 of Glenbow Stone, and about 50 stonecutters worked on building this structure. It was demolished in 1970. Just behind it and to the right, you can see a tall smokestack built of brick, and just in front of that is the heating plant. The heating plant was built in 1909 out of Glenbow Stone, and it was connected to the other buildings on this block by underground service tunnels. It was also demolished in 1970. On the far right of the slide, you can see the old courthouse. Obviously in this picture, the new Calgary Courthouse number no. two hadn't yet been constructed and the old one was still standing. This old uh, courthouse was built about 1888 with sandstone from John McCallum's Sunnyside Quarry. In this building, each stone is about 16 inches thick and may have weighed up to 400 pounds. It was the first and the largest courthouse built in the Northwest Territories by the Canadian government. So it was an important building and it served a vital purpose. It was eventually outgrown and that's why we have Calgary Courthouse number two. That meant that Courthouse number one could be used for other functions. And it was for many years. Then in 1957, Alderman Mary Dover, that was the name for a, counsel a counselor at the time, they just called them Alderman. She tried really hard to preserve it. Part of the reason was because her grandfather, Colonel James McLeod, who was very important to Calgary history, had sat as a judge there. So she knew its importance and it had a personal relevance to her. So she submitted a petition that had been signed by more than 16,000 Calgarians to the Alberta government, asking them to preserve it as a historic site. To give you some concept of how many that was, that's about seven and a half percent of the Calgary population at the time. But the Alberta government didn't um, take that into account and it was demolished in 1958. When we go back to this slide and look at the architectural styles that we see, we get an idea of how those changed through time. In the 1880s, the building on the far right, it was common to use rough hewn stone on the exterior of a building. And another word for this is rusticated. So rusticated stones were a common um, architectural style. But as time went on, things changed. And in the middle of the photograph, you can see the other two buildings and they have exteriors with smooth surfaces on them. And their style is very classical in architectural style. So you've got um, uh, columns and pediments and all kinds of design items like that. 
And it's meant to give an impression of solidity and strength and stability. Even the little heating building, which is really a utilitarian building, nobody would go into it, still had some of those features so that it fit within that architectural style. This is a photograph from the Shelley Quarry, which was located at Cochrane, and this photo is from around 1890. This was the quarry that supplied the stone for the CPR station in Calgary. Here you can see that station in 1905, and you can tell we don't have those buildings anymore in Calgary. They've also been lost to us. And the station was composed of three that you can see in this photo. There's the wooden building. It's a freight shed on the far left. And then there are two sandstone buildings. Those two sandstone buildings were moved to another location. One went to Claire's home and the other one went to High River. And you can see it here shown during a flood, <laughs> surprise, surprise, in June, 1923. They were moved because we needed a new station in Calgary. Tenders opened in June of 1907 and the men worked all winter constructing it. This was taken in April of 1908. And at that time there were 32 stone cutters, 15 laborers, four stonemasons and four bricklayers working on this building. This was the first stage of its construction. It formed the central part of the new station. And here you can see it in much better photograph of it in the center completed. And you can still see those other three buildings beside it. By 1912, two wings had been built on the sides of the central building and those other sandstone buildings had been removed. So that gives you kind of a general idea of some of the examples of sandstone, why Calgary is called the sandstone city and um, sort of where they were and that's some of the styles that were used. But now I really wanna to shift to talk about the people who built the sandstone buildings. Most of them were transitory in some respect, at least for some of the time, they had to follow the work from place to place across the continent and overseas. And a particular individual may have worked on more than one building, on many buildings in one location, for example, in Calgary, before work ran out and they had to move somewhere else. And as well, they may have worked at many quarries. An individual building would have many different building trades involved in its construction. And I'm mostly going to focus on the stone workers and in particular the stone cutters, um, because it, there are so many different kinds, as you'll see in just a second. By the 1890s, more than half of the skilled tradesmen in Calgary were stone cutters or masons. And there was a strong tradition in certain cultures for this profession. Um, Scotland, Italy, France uh, had a strong tradition of stone carving and it's often evident from the names of the men what their ancestry was. There were several processes involved in building a sandstone structure. First you had to acquire the stone, prepare it, build the stone, finish the sandstone. So let's look at some of those stages. First off, obviously you need the quarry. And here you would find quarry workers and laborers. The quarry workers had experience getting the stone off the cliff. The laborers just did the heavy lifting and the unskilled work. Then the stone may go to a cutting plant. There you would find engineers who worked an engine. So it didn't mean the same thing as we think of today. There were machinists, likewise working machines. And some machines were specialized. So planer men, like James Fairley here, worked on planes. Um, a planer machine, in this case, it's the Anderson machine. You can just make it out on that slide. And he's very proudly standing next to it. From there, the stone would go to the building site. At the building site, you would find a range of men. There'd be building laborers, mortar mixers, stone masons, bricklayers, and stone cutters. Now those um, names um, sound similar and in many ways their jobs, their tasks overlapped. 
And this ended up causing some trouble later on with the unions, as I'm going to explain. You can see from this slide that the wage that was paid also varied. So laborers at a mere 25 cents an hour and the highest paid were the stone cutters at 62 and a half cents an hour in 1909, which is when this data is from. But the bricklayers and the stonemasons could do similar tasks and the stonemasons and the stonecutters could also do some tasks that overlapped. So this is where the conflict came in because they were being paid different amounts of money. Most of the information about stone cutters and stone buildings in Calgary, and I think the best information, comes from John Gillespie's diary, which used to be found in the microfilms department at the Glenbow Archives, and I think now it may be at the Glenbow Library and Archive Western Research Centre held at the University of Calgary. But frankly, I haven't gone to look at it recently, so I'm not exactly sure which location holds it. Gillespie arrived in Calgary in 1893, and his diary spans the next 38 years. And we're going to look at some of the buildings that he worked on. He began as an independent stonecutter. And here's one of the buildings that he worked on, the Post Office Customs and Revenue Building. It stood on 8th Avenue East corner of 1st Street. The post office existed between 1894 and 1913 or 14. Today that space is filled with the Calgary Public Building, which was built in 1931. So in 1893 and 1894, Gillespie was working here, helping to build it. And his diary gives us some detail about where he was and what he was doing on different days. So we know that on this 26th of October, 1893, they were building the step walls. So the little short walls on either side of the stairs. On the 27th and the 28th, they were setting the steps. On November, November 7th, they were setting the steps on the east door. And on the 18th and 17th of November, William Henry Hillis, who is John Gillespie's father-in-law, was pointing. And what that means is he was filling in the mortar between the faces of the stones on the exterior. By 1901, Gillespie was a successful entrepreneur running multiple projects. One of them was the Clarence Block. James Lougheed hired him to rebuild the Clarence Block after the original building burned down on Christmas 1900. And Lougheed wanted it built fast and Gillespie did. It was rebuilt and reopened in February of 1901. So that's only really a couple of months after the original building burned down. The architect was William Dodd, and he was also the architect for some other projects in the city, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. And in, diary, in Gillespie's diary, he notes that there were difficulties getting Dodd to pay the final bill because Dodd wanted to make sure that the pointing didn't fall out of the wall. And Gillespie was a bit offended by this because he was a professional, he knew what he was doing. He just had a hard time getting paid. In 1905, Gillespie is shown here working on the Central Methodist Church, which is now the Central United Church. And um, he's there, got the circle around him with a little X in the middle. And if you notice where he is standing in relation to the building structures, there are three windows with a bow coming out of the main wall there. So I'm gonna advance the slide. If you look on this picture of the completed building with all the construction debris around it in 1911, the place where Gillespie was standing is on the far left in the shadow there where you've got those three windows. This is a, a slightly later image, but much clearer. And you can see those three windows sort of left of center on this slide. You can also um, get an idea of the texture on the exterior of this building. So I said earlier that in the early 1900s, they switched from rusticated structures on the outside to smooth faces. But in this case, they didn't, they wanted a traditional looking building, something that looked old, like it had been there for a long time for this church. And the windows echo that idea with the kind of a Gothic arch to them. So that was, you know, one of the reasons why you'd have some variability in the styles of the sandstone. 
1906 and 1907, Gillespie was climbing the career ladder and he was working for the Provincial Department of Public Works, supervising various sites. One of those sites was the Normal School. Now this name always kind of threw me. The reason it's called a Normal School when it's really a teacher training college is because they, those colleges were supposed to establish the norm or the pattern that would be followed in other schools. Now it's known as McDougall Center. It was built between 1906 and 1908. About 60 men worked on it, but all did not go smoothly during the construction of this building. On the 1st of November, 1907, Sidney Cornford, a 27 year old, was helping with hauling the girders up, the steel girders that form the interior structure of this building. Sydney was holding a line when the rope broke and the girder fell, weighed about a ton. And unfortunately it hit him and fractured his skull and his collarbone and he was killed. Gillespie notes four days later in his diary, all hands laid off to attend the funeral, quite a large turnout. Not a good beginning to a building and more difficulties were to come. Less than two months later, a new problem came up. On the 23rd of December, 1907, the BC Contract Company, which was in charge of the construction of this building, went bankrupt. The government stepped in, took over, so that this normal school, the first in the province, could be completed, and they put Gillespie in charge. Here it stands today. It officially opened on November uh, in 1908, and there was a, a big deal made. There was an orchestra, there were addresses to the crowds, there was a chorus of students, and there was a banquet to follow. And when you look closely, it has beautiful detail on it. The building was put to various uses over the years. Um, by 1986, they actually restored the west side back to similar to how it had been in the beginning. And they're still maintaining it. Uh, I visited the site in June of this year and I found some stonemasons there replacing the granite steps in front of the building at the main entrance. If we look at the north entrance on the side, we actually have a lot more detail in Gillespie's diary about this. We know the name of the man who carved it. It was Barney Carrier. A close-up of the door here. It took him 15 eight-hour days to carve this doorway and he finished it on the 19th of November 1907. If we zoom in on the arch above the door, above there's a little uh, balcony and then there's a window and the arch above that window, here we are looking at it here, this is how he spent his next two days. It took him that long to put the egg and dart detail around that arch at the top. If you look closely at some of the detail, you can see how much effort went into this. Everything had to be exactly symmetrical and the same. It was a very, uh, a job that required a lot of skill. And in 1909, the government hired Barney Carrier um, as a quarry inspector at Glenbow Quarry. His skill had been recognized. Gillespie then went on to become the superintendent of construction of the legislature, land titles, and courthouse in Edmonton. And here you can see him. He's at the stonecutter's shed at the legislature, and he's sitting beside the architect, the provincial architect, A.M. Jeffers. And Gillespie liked to work with his family, as we've already seen in the post office. He was working with his father-in-law at that stage. Now he's working with his brother-in-law, this is Thomas Hillis, and Gillespie is also working with his son, Billy Gillespie. This is a common pattern in this trade because of the practice of apprenticing your sons into the same business. Just before his retirement, Gillespie settled into the position of chief caretaker of the Calgary Courthouse. That's the number two. Here's another stone cutter who apprenticed under his father. This is Norman F. Priestley. He started in 1898 at the age of 14, which was what apprentices usually did. His family arrived in Canada in 1904 
and he took out a homestead northwest of Edmonton in 1905. Now, as most homesteaders did, he sought outside employment while he was proving up his homestead. Priestley worked at stone cutting in Calgary, and he also attended college in Edmonton at the same time, and his homestead was granted in October 1911. He was later interviewed about stone cutting, and he said, for buildings that were still standing, the best from a stone cutter's view was McDougall's school. So I'm not alone in thinking that it's a phenomenal example of stone cutting. Priestley also said that Patrick Burns's home had been, and this is a quote, perfect from a stone cutter's standpoint, and that it was the finest example of sandstone work to be seen anywhere in Canada. Now, unfortunately, this building was destroyed. Here's a building that Priestley actually uh, contributed stone cutting to. He worked on the Brock building from June to October of 1906. And it stood on the corner of 2nd Street and 8th Avenue West on the south side. W.R. Brock was a dry goods wholesaler. So the building was full of gentlemen's clothing, furnishings, carpets, ladies ready to wear clothing. And it was destroyed in 1956. Priestley also worked on the Imperial Bank from February to May of 1909. And that's on the corner of 8th Avenue and Center Street. This is a maybe familiar picture to you from one of the first slides that I showed. This is the same building or part of it anyways, and it was remodeled in 1909 to make it into the Imperial Bank. And Priestley was responsible for some of the intricate carvings on this building. He also worked on the Grain Exchange Building, which was built from 1909 to 1910. It's located at 815 First Street Southwest. The architect was Hodgson and Bates, and I'm gonna mention them again. And it was owned by William, by W.R. Hull, who was a founding member of the Grain Exchange, and you might recognize his name because he was one of the Stampede's big four. This building was the first skyscraper in Calgary. If you look at the edges of the photograph, you can see some of the neighboring buildings standing less than half the height. So at six stories, this was an impressive building. And it's the only one with sandstone cladding going all the way up to such a height. In 1910, it housed 21 grain companies and the grain exchange. Communication was by telegraph and they would communicate with other major grain center centers in order to set the Alberta grain prices. If we go to the side of the building and look at the ornate central doorway facing First Street, um, I want to draw your attention to some of that ornate um, carving and Priestley carved that elaborate sandstone arch and some of the other details on this side. So I thought it was an interesting coincidence that a farmer helped to build the grain exchange. But Priestley was not just a farmer or a stone cutter. He got a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Alberta in 1916. He served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force in World War I in 1916. And later he was ordained at St. Stephen's College as a Methodist pastor. And he served as a pastor in Wainwright and in Coaldale, Alberta. But besides all that, he was involved in politics. In 1906, he sat on the Building Trades Council. He was also the first chairman and manager and later general manager of the United Farmers of Alberta Cooperative Limited for more than 20 years. In 1931 to 1940, he was the vice president. Then in 1933, he was the secretary of the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. He was also the secretary of the Alberta Wheat Board. So he helped to sow the seeds of political change in Alberta. But he never forgot about his stone cutting. He gave his opinion on various Calgary buildings, some of which I have shared with you. And he stated, the city hall may be good, but it is a Rococo design and I cannot say I like it. Which leads us to the city hall possibly Calgary's most familiar sandstone building, especially because of its recent restoration. It was built from 1907 
1911, it has 15,522 pieces of sandstone in it. The architect was William Dodd. Now remember, Gillespie had some problems with him earlier on. The contractor was the Alberta Building Company, which I abbreviate as ABC. I don't know if they did that intentionally. Most of the workers were subcontracted by the stonemasons, James Groundwater and Thomas Muir. Later, Thomas moved away to work in the United States, but he enlisted in the Canadian Expeditionary Force and served in World War I. He suffered a gunshot wound in the arm and the foot, and three weeks after his discharge from the hospital, he died of influenza. City Hall had its share of problems as well. The first construction accident at City Hall occurred on Saturday, November 2nd, 1907. Now that date might sound a little familiar if you can remember all of the dates I've thrown at you in this talk, because it was the day after Sidney Cornford died at the normal school. Not a good week for construction. In this case, the excavation caved in and it struck a workman and it covered him in dirt. He had dirt in his mouth and his ears and his eyes. His ankle was badly bruised. They dug him out, they sent him to the hospital and he was treated and released. So at least he had a happier outcome. Here's the cornerstone of the city hall being laid on the 15th of September, 1908. It's a big deal. I can see lots of big hats in that picture. And the city kept a record of the men who were working that day because they knew it was a momentous event. So here's one of the pages from the city archives that shows the stone cutters who were working that day. And there are a few names on this list that I'm going to be mentioning later in just a moment. Um, there were also other workmen and there are lists of their names as well. Masons, Mason laborers, bricklayers and general laborers. But when we focus on the stone cutters who worked there, one of them was Hugh McPherson. So a little bit about Hugh, just to make it more real. He was born in Scotland, as you might have guessed from his name. He served in the Boer War in South Africa before this photograph was taken. And later he served as a corporal in World War I. He, he participated in the Battle of the Somme in July, 1916, where he suffered a severe gunshot wound in the right thigh. But he was sent to England to the hospital and he recovered and was sent back to the front. But then more tragedy struck. His wife living in Ontario died leaving four children under the age of 16. So Hugh McPherson was discharged on compassionate grounds so that he could ensure their care. There were lots of financial problems with this huge city hall project and recurrent labor disputes between the workers and the contractors ABC. For example, in May and June of 1908, the stone cutters and masons got upset. They wanted to be paid at the work site, not at the offices of the Alberta Building Company. They said it adds so much time and distance after a long day of work to go all the way to the office and stand in line for a really long time just to get a check, which we then have to go to the bank to cash. So there was a strike, then there was a lockout, and then the result was a lot of bad feelings. But that wasn't even the major problem that they had at the city hall. The major problem was the overall cost. It had been estimated as lead, needing to uh, use $85,000, but ABC was paid $105,000. So this all came to a head in the spring of 1909. There was a big inquiry and eventually the architect Dodd was held responsible. He was dismissed and the city took over. At that point, the stonecutters and other men had to put in their claims for unpaid wages to the city as the city was trying to straighten out all of the accounts. So this is the claim that Thomas Sear put in and he was one of the men who had been there on the day when the cornerstone was laid. Then in January of 1910, the architects Hodgson and Bates, remember them from the Grain Exchange, took over and they finished the building and City Hall was completed the next year. 
Thomas Sear had worked at Glenbow as a stonecutter, which is how I came across his name. Here's a photo of Thomas at work. You can see the big heavy mallet he's got in his hand. And like many stonecutters, he also joined the CEF. He signed up in May of 1915. And here you can see him at uh, the barracks in Calgary in 1916. By September of that year, he was at the Somme. He suffered a gunshot wound in the hand, the leg, and the face. And here's a photo of him after that battle. You can see the scar running across his cheek. And his uniform is slightly different. And you can see on his sleeve, he's got some patches. If it was in color, you could see that it's a blue triangle uh, surmounting a red rectangle. And that means he was in the 15th Battalion and the 48th Highlanders of Canada. Thomas Sear was also a member of a union. Unions were a big part of the building trades in Calgary. They regulated how much someone was paid per hour, the number of hours they worked in a day, and the number of days they worked in a week. And of course, I'm focusing on the stonecutters. So when we look at some examples of unions for the stonecutters, in June of 1902, so that was quite early on, there was a strike and the reason was published as being that they can only work five and a half months per year due to the weather. And then when the weather cooperates, the stone supply was too erratic. So they needed to be paid more money so they'd be able to survive the whole year long. Their wages were increased from 40 cents an hour and their hours were reduced to nine hours a day. Then the stonecutters joined um, another union in February of 1903. The Stone and Brick Workers Union was formed. There were 20 charter members and they were paid 45 cents an hour for a nine hour day. Then an international union, the Journeyman Stonecutters Association of North America. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this. It's the oldest active union, so they claim, in North America. It was based on the tradition of Mason's lodges from the Middle Ages. And it's believed that in Washington, stonecutters marched together at the laying of the cornerstone of the US Capitol in 1792. The International Union was officially founded in 1853 and it included African-American members, which was progressive for a union in the late 1800s. In the late 1960s, this union merged with the Laborers International Union of North America. So it had a very long run for a union. The Calgary branch of this union was founded in April of 1904. There were 12 members. They were paid 55 cents an hour for an eight hour day. And they worked 48 hours a week. So that means they were working six days a week. The next, uh, advance for them was in 1907, they got paid 60 cents an hour and they got a half day off on Saturday in the summertime. 1908, that half day of a Saturday was extended to the entire year. 1909, their wages increased to 62 and a half cents an hour. So they were earning $5 a day. And then in 1911, when there were 150 members in this branch, they earned 65 cents an hour. Calgary union, unions were also a community. Now again, this is from St. Paul, Minnesota, but it gives you an idea of some of the kinds of decorations that would be used for a Labor Day parade. In September of 1908, 38 stonecutters participated in the Calgary parade. And the Herald said, the stonecutters had a large flat wagon on which were several tradesmen modeling great stones, while around the canopy, which was sus suspended over the workmen, were signs and banners emblematic of the craft. Unions also organized social events. And in Calgary, in January of 1908, was the first stonecutters ball. It was a dinner and there were Scottish dances and about a hundred couples attended and they felt it was one of the most successful dances ever given by a local union. The union also would assist in times of need, like with a funeral. And the example here is Mrs. Pattison's funeral in 1909. 
and her obituary read, amongst the numerous flowers was a lovely wreath of pink roses from the Stonecutters Union. Four of the pallbearers were members of the Stonecutters Union, of which Mr. Patterson is a member. So unions pulled their members together in times of need. And of course, when you think of a union, the biggest time of need is when there's a strike. In April of 1912, there was a big one. The stonecutters said that even the rough stone, which was called shoddy, must be cut by union members, not by quarry workers and not by masons. The stonecutters and the masons unions did not get along because the work that they did was so similar. So they fought over which union had the right to do that work. It took the international unions years to settle this problem, but that left the men on the ground kind of out of luck. So they had to come up with a way to work together while still abiding by the rules of the union. So they made an arrangement. They got the builder to specify very precisely the type of stonework that needed to be done, the size of different pieces of stone, the types of decoration, and then the work would clearly fall within the realm of one union or the other, and they didn't have to fight about it. In 1911, the Alberta Stonecutters Union branches held a conference. So if you're looking at the bottom of the slide at the men's names and their locations, you can see that they come from all over Alberta. Here we've got Thomas Ward and Donald Douglas. Both of these men worked at City Hall, along with William J. Doherty. Now Doherty's name is on the Cornerstone Day List, and he was an early Calgary arrival. He actually had an exhibit in the 1891 Calgary Exhibition, and the Herald reported that his exhibit shows samples of cut stone very nicely got up. One of them is a clock stand with a small round clock inserted in it, presenting a very pretty appearance. And Doherty won the first and second prize for his display. In 1904, at the start of the Stonecutters Union branch, he was the secretary treasurer. In 1908 and 09, he was the Calgary Trades Labor Council president. By 1910, he was working at Glenbow Quarry and there the owner had grave complaints against him because he was undermining the company's authority. By 1914, he was the vice president of the Calgary branch of the Stonecutters. Also in this photo, we have W.C. Mason. And later the same year, Here's Mason again at the Trades and Labor Convention of Canada, which was held in Calgary. And at this point, he is president of the local Calgary branch of stonecutters. Many stonecutters were also athletes and Mason was one of them. He played football, which we know as soccer. And along with other stonecutters, here we can see him circled, um, uh, and the team he's playing on is the Stonecutters football team. So all of them, Stonecutters from Calgary, and they are playing in the Calgary Trades Union League. And they were the winner of the league for 1911. Here's the same team, the Calgary Stonecutters football team in 1906. And in the circle there, we have Joseph Towell and he was the Calgary branch strike secretary during that big strike of 1912. He also played with Mason on another team, and this is the Caledonia Football Club in Calgary's Senior League. So they had a trades league and they had a senior league. And the Caledonian team, known as the Callies, were very good players. This was the premier team. And there were also two other stonecutters on this team. David Thompson and Jack Ross. And playing for the Callies was a really big deal. It was all over the sports pages. The reason was that this team was the national championship team for three years running. Here we can see them after the championship game in 1908. And in the circle is Joseph Tell, looking pretty tough, I must say. And here we've also got another stonecutter, Andy McLean, and there's Jack Ross again. So they've just come from a pretty tough game, look a little bit beat up, but boy, they look strong. 
the last example that I'm going to give about Calgary stone cutters, I think is the most interesting for me anyway. If we go back to the City Hall pay list, here's a page where the men had to sign their name when they were receiving their money for pay. There are many of these pages in the files in City Hall. And if we look at some of the names, you can see some of the people that I've been talking about. There's, there's William Doherty, there's Thomas Sear. Um, who else do we have there that I've talked about? Uh, if you're Thomas Ward, if you're looking at the different names, you can see that they're predominantly English sounding. Um, Dow, Newman, um, McDonald. Most of the stonecutters came from Great Britain, but some did come from other countries. And here's a receipt for stone carving from the ABC company to Hugo Klinkett. And from his name, you can tell that he is from Germany. He arrived in Canada in 1907 with his wife, Dora. He registered for a homestead that had already been abandoned by another stone cutter and Hugo did not complete the homestead either. We find him here on January 29th, 1909, signing for his pay after doing some carving at City Hall. Two years from this date, in January of 1911, Hugo and Dora went to the United States. In 1918, he had to fill out an enemy alien register um, because the US had joined the First World War and Germany, of course, was the enemy. He eventually, he got his US citizenship. At that point, he had been living with his wife, Dora, for more than a decade. However, the same time that he registered for his naturalization papers, he also registered for a marriage certificate in the United States. The year was 1921, but he arrived in Calgary in 1907 with his wife, Dora. So I thought that was a bit odd. So it appears that they ran away together from Germany in 1907. And when we look at Dora's records, we find an even more interesting story. Dora got married in Germany when she was 21. Then a month later, she gave birth. She raised her child to adulthood. And then in 1907, she left her son and her husband. And she traveled to Canada, specifically to Calgary, with Hugo Clinkett. Dora was 48 and Hugo was 39. Then it gets really interesting when we look at the city hall records. Here we can see Dora getting paid on June 10th $180. So why was this payment made? Well, the, the record is made at the time period when the city took over the building of City Hall and they were trying to straighten out all of the complicated accounts. It was very difficult for them. So they were making lists, lots and lots of lists. And there's another list of accounts and on it we see Dora's name for that $180. But what we also see is that it says she's a stone carver. So I think that this shows that she was a stone carver working on the city hall, that in 1909, there was a woman helping to build the city hall. Now you might be doubtful and one piece of evidence isn't undeniable proof. So a question might be, is she just getting paid for her husband's work? And there was at least one case of that documented, but the only other case is of a woman picking up a paycheck for her husband. She signs her name, Mrs. S. Bryant. So she's signing her husband's name. The check isn't made out to her. The money isn't made out to her. So this seems odd that it would be made out to Dora if she was picking up Hugo's money. There's a, another little bit of corroborating evidence when we look at the um, border crossing in 1911 when they go to the States. We find out that Dora is five feet each, eight inches tall and she weighs 200 pounds. So she's a big, strong German woman who could probably heave one of those mallets that we saw Thomas Sear holding. Now I would love to find more proof, more evidence that would support my hypothesis. 
And I've tried looking through records in Germany, but I've been foiled by three things. First off, this is an example of her death certificate here. First off, the problem is that she's German, so it's in a foreign language that I can't read very well. The second problem is that in this time period, they used a script that's very difficult to read. If you look at the typing, you can see it's very curly. It's called Fraktur as a type font, a font type. And if you look at the handwriting, it's also very curly. The letters are drawn in a different way. And there's two types of styles that are used. One is current and the other is Suterlin. And they're very difficult to decipher unless you have some practice. And the third problem I've got is the lack of digital records that are available. So I thought if I was going to see if she was a stonecutter, it would be ideal if I could find her obituary and maybe it would say that she was a stone carver. But when I looked at the online records that were available, she died in Hamburg and the last date of available digitized papers online ended the day before she died. So there's lots more research that needs to be done in order to solve this mystery. And if you have any tips that you'd like to give me, you can enter those in into the comments as well. So in conclusion, I hope that you are now familiar with why and how Calgary became known as the Sandstone City. And the next time that you see a sandstone building in Calgary, like when you're rushing by them in your commute downtown, like these people are, that you will appreciate some of the skill that was involved in their construction. And you'll recognize the time that it took to create the beautiful details on these buildings. And that you'll remember the people who built the Sandstone City were people who were multifaceted, entrepreneurs and supervisors like John Gillespie, farmers and political activists like Norman Priestley, sportsmen and union men like W.C. Mason and Joseph Tao, and maybe that there might have even been some ethnic and gender diversity like the couple Hugo and Dora Clinkett. Thank you. Wow, what a pleasant presentation this was. Thank you, Sherry. Um, we will take the questions now. Uh, we got a number of questions. Uh, and the first one is, uh, what is your favorite uh, sandstone building? Oh, that's a tough one. There's so many to choose from. Um, I featured the normal school and it's uh, my favorite for a number of reasons that are very personal to me. I used to live just a block away. So I was exposed to it early on. So I think that might be part of the reason that it's my favorite. Um, but I would recommend if you're interested in finding out more that you check out that thing that I, I'm trying to line it up here, that um, I mentioned online, and it gives you a lot to choose from. There's some beautiful buildings on Stephen Avenue with all kinds of intricate details, and they're really a pleasure to look at. So I, I guess I would say the normal school of force, but there's a lot on Stephen Avenue that are beautiful. That's right. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. Um, how can I register for the Glambo Ranch Provincial Park uh, 10th anniversary celebration events? Um, you can go to their website. It's grpf.ca, uh, Glenbo Ranch Park Foundation.ca, and um, look at the events. And there are several events that are offered on August 8th and August 9th. Uh, the last time I looked, they had a history golf cart tour, a wildflower tour, and I'm giving one that's also a history tour, golf cart tour, but it's focusing on the quarry and the quarry workers. So it's just a part of the history. And there may be more coming up that um, will be posted. So you can look there. Excellent. Uh, another question. What is Calgary's newest uh, sandstone building? Oh, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I told you when most of them were built up until 1914, one that I know of that was built after that, that's historic, is Heritage Hall, which is at SAIT. Uh, and it was built, I think, in 1921. Um, and I'm sure there's more that I'm unaware of. Uh, and maybe somebody else in the comments can, can give a better date on that than I can. Uh, do they still build such buildings, sandstone? Um, 
again, I, I'm not like okay. I'm not really good on present day stuff. I'm more <laughs> history stuff. Um, it's still you can still use sandstone to build it, um, but I don't think they do it very often because I think it's quite expensive and hard to source the sandstone. So, for example, when they were doing the restoration work for the city hall, they had to um, source the sandstone to use. So it's not as common. Um, they tend to use in the newer office buildings. They use uh, fancier stones. Um, especially on the interiors, like different marbles and um, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other types of stone, uh, more metamorphic rocks that they, rather than sedimentary rocks that they use on them, be limestone, there's lots of limestone buildings, um, because they tend to stand up a little better in some cases. Okay. Another question, do we know where the sandstone rubble from demolished buildings you have mentioned ended up? Was it reused? Uh, some of it was, yes. Um, for example, um, the land titles building and the heating building, I believe they salvaged that. So when the city did demolish some of those buildings, they set it aside to use for repairs in the ones in the buildings they were going to keep. When they demolished the Patrick Burns um, home, some of those stones ended up in the park, um, the Patrick Burns Memorial Gardens. Um, at Riley Park. So, you know, a bit of diverse reuse of them. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, why so many beautiful sandstone buildings were destroyed, especially in the 70s? And are those uh, that are left uh, better protected today? I believe they are better protected today. I mean, for example, in down, downtown Calgary, it's a national historic district. So I think part of the problem was that it took time to appreciate them, for one. Um, you know, the older something gets, sometimes the more we appreciate it because it's different from what we're used to. And in the 70s, there was rapid expansion and everything was a very, in the 50s, right through the 70s, everybody was focused on the future rather than on the past. And things were changing so rapidly that they didn't really care so much about the past. It, it wasn't important to them. But it's uh, increasingly important to us today. So that's why we have um, more designations that are happening and more protection for them. And the laws change as well. Um, in the realm of archaeology, for example, the heritage um, law didn't come into effect until 1973-74. So prior to that, there wouldn't have been the same care in trying to preserve an archaeological site. So I think it's similar in the case for historic standing structures as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, what led to end of trade in Calgary and as a profession overall in Canada? Uh, I'm, is trade meaning as uh, masonry? Like what led to the end of the trade? Well, end of it, trade, yeah. It hasn't really ended. There's still stone cutters out there and you, they had to um, use stone cutters to restore the city hall, for example. Well, it's just not as common for sure um, because there are so many other um, less expensive building materials available. Um, but um, there was a huge project to restore the parliament buildings and they um, had modern day stone cutters working there. So the trade still exists. It's just not as common. They're, they're not the main uh, trade anymore. Um, and there are still schools that teach it. And um, I've met some of the instructors um, from out east who, who teach how to do it. And, and so it still does exist. It's just more rare. Okay. Uh, how many stonecutters worked on the latest restoration of the city hall? Ooh, excellent question. A very detailed question that I don't remember the answer to. <laughs> Sorry, I can't answer that one. <laughs> but I bet the city um, website would have that kind of detail on it. They have several articles that talk about um, the history of the building and also the rebuilding or the re restoration of it. There's an actually a good article. The picture on the front of it is of, of a female stonecutter working. So I can't remember the name of that article though. But if you go to the city website and, and oh, I've seen that article actually. Yeah, yeah I've seen the picture. I, yeah, I think it says in there 
but I'm not sure. It talks about her anyway and about modern stone cutting. So that that'll sort of half answer the question that came before as well. If you That's right. That. Yeah. Uh, another question: How many qu quarries were in the in and around Calgary? Ah, that's a tricky question. Um, at least a dozen. And the reason why it's tricky is, as I was trying to explain before, is that um, when you read about them, you might be reading a newspaper and it says um, John McCallum's quarry, but it doesn't say where. And he may have bought and sold multiple quarries. So it becomes a real struggle to um, trace them all through time as they're changing ownership. And I think that the person who was um, working on that book that I mentioned for Edworthy Park, um, for the Edworthy Historic Society, I think that person did some of the work. And I think um, Harry Saunders was also doing some work on figuring out the quarries and, and who owned them and when and all that kind of stuff. And I think some of that is um, also going to be on that City of Calgary website about the City Hall as well. The map though was a bit outdated, but it gives you a really good basis. It just don't take it for absolute truth. It's more complicated than what that map says. Okay. Another question. Is it possible to have a future presentation that focuses on the sandstone schools in the city? That would be lovely. So. There are so many beautiful sandstone schools and I didn't mention them at all. And, um, that would be a great topic for the future, for sure. You should take note of that, Zorica. <laughs> uh, will this program be available on the library website? Uh, that's a question for you guys. Yes, Zorica, do you have an answer for that? It's being recorded. I'm guessing it will be available. Um, no, no, it won't be. And I replied to that person. Oh, OK. OK, thank you. Well, now everyone knows. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, dude. Okay, help with German research. Try the Alberta Family History Society as they may have members experienced in German research. Yes. Uh, that's a comment for you, I think, for yes, yeah, finding I mean, out more information on Dora, was it? Yes. I would, uh, I would like I would like to find about that, yeah. If yeah, and I, <laughs> I am actually a member of that society, and yes, they are wonderful people there, and I have talked to a couple of them over the years in my German research, so yes, I they are a wonderful resource, for sure. Okay, perfect. Uh, did Calgary have any sandstone bridges? Ah, Glenbow Stone was actually used in several bridges, and one of them... Uh, was in Calgary, yes, in Calgary, but they didn't put them where we could see them. They used the stone as part of the piers to support the structure that sat on top of it. So yes, sandstone was used in the bridges, um, but the Glenbow stone that I know of was actually underwater. <laughs> okay, uh, there is another question. Is the Glenbow and Edwardy quarries the only quarries in Calgary area that are somewhat protected by being in a park? Uh, no, there is another quarry that's in a park that I can think of, uh, think of right off the top of my head. And that's the one that's along those, uh, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe it. There's a golf course uh, I think it's called the Panorama Golf Course or the Country Hills Golf Course. It's right off Country Hills. And as you're driving along, um, what is it? Beddington Trail, you drive right by that golf course and at Country Hills and there's a quarry right in there and it's a kind of a walking park. It's right beside the golf course. So there are other quarries that are in parks. Um, there's, I, there's an, if, there's another uh, sandstone quarry um, by Sunnyside, and I think it's in a green space. So there's varying levels of protection if you wanna talk about being in a park. Um, some parks are owned by the city, some parks are owned by the province. And Glenbow actually is in a provincial park, um, but there's now a question over how protected it is because of a new reservoir that the government wants to build. Okay. I think that's all for the questions. And there's a lot of comments about how wonderful the presentation was. Um, 
uh, they're thankful for it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of comments like that. Uh, uh, there is a, one more question just came in. Out of all the topics in the world, why did you decide stone cutting was just right for you? <laughs> um, I happened upon it, actually. I was working um, on archaeology in Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park, and I was doing historic research, and I came across this great resource called the Stonecutter's Journal, which I could access online and on microfiche, and it had tons of details about the stone cutters and the more I found out about them the more interesting they were to me and that's why I ended up focusing on the stone cutters I just sort of fell into it that's great and that was the best presentation of the historic week you are a great speaker and have an obvious love of the topic thank you for your time and passion Oh, thank Thank you. That is so sweet. Thank you. That makes my day, I have to say. That was very interesting and unusual topic. I would love a presentation on schools. So I know. I'll I'll put that on my to-do list. (laughs) Excellent. Um, And I think that's it with the questions. Uh, We'll just wrap it up. Uh, Thank you very much, Sherry, for this presentation and Walt for organizing it. And to our attendees, thank you for joining us tonight. Please remember to check out our website at ChinookHistory.ca for information regarding the rest of our programs, virtual and in person.